Welcome, everybody, to the Giller Spotlight podcast. Today, I'm super excited. We have a wonderful guest, Armando Varek uh, Caraval. Is that how you pronounce your last name, by the way? I, just, I should have confirmed right. that before. before. Carvajal. Armando Varek Carvajal, yeah. Well, amazing. I, I love it. Um, I would love to give our guests a quick background um, of yourself and Armando. I know you have a super interesting background being a first uh born immigrant from Mexico, arrived at, at the States at the age of four. Um, so if you can give our listeners a background of yourself, uh, I think. Absolutely. And Tiger, thank you so much. Thank you for, for inviting me. It's an honor uh, to, to talk about my journey and also to share this with a lot of other founders and people in the ecosystem. But um, I'm Armando. Um, I'm a co-founder and CEO of Hang Tight, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But I'm an entrepreneur, second time entrepreneur, and I am also a first generation immigrant uh, from Mexico. I, I moved to America when I was just four years old. Um, I grew up in South Texas along the border. Um, my parents uh, basically gave up everything, right, to, to come to America. They gave up their careers. My dad was in government. He wanted to be president of Mexico. Um, I think he probably would have achieved it by now. My mom was a doctor and, you know, they gave all of that to come to America, um, as missionaries. Um, I was just too kid. I was too young at the time to really understand what was going on. So I was just tagging along, but I think that was perhaps one of the most important decisions they've ever made. And it's impacted my life all for it because I'm here today. Um, a testament of, of their dream and vision to, to pursue the American dream. Um, I'm also, uh, a very proud member of the Pride community um, and uh, very, very involved in the startup community. Mm -hmm. I think um, I've been doing startups for about almost 10 years, um, mm -hmm. if you can count that. Uh, for quick context, here in Austin, um, I've been in the city for about 15 years. I studied at the University of Texas, uh, where I focused on uh, international relations, focused on corporate communication. I did two different degrees, uh, primarily because well, I didn't know what I wanted to study. <laughs> right, right, right. Armando, I just want to take a quick step back uh, and go back to the days yep. uh, when you first arrived in the States. Uh, you mentioned yep. that you didn't speak English fluently. Uh, me personally, I was born in Japan. I grew up in Missoula, Montana, um, a predominantly white community. And for me, I had a lot of difficulties growing up with just that. I knew English. A lot of my friends were Americans. So I couldn't imagine from your perspective coming to Texas. I'm sure there's a lot of Hispanic people being in, um, in Texas. But just all, if you can kind of just describe that transition, how you adapted uh, to learn English. Um, and then also just, I think, also being from Montana, it is not like super lgbtq um as i'm sure texas could be a little bit similar so i'm sure there's a lot of uh, different challenges or different obstacles you had to overcome so if you could describe just first come to texas and then just kind of go from there yeah definitely and really good points um well i think the it it, it was very challenging and i would say to an extent it still is to this very day um, adapting and assimilating into a new culture is not easy. And I think unless you've actually done it, it's very difficult to understand and to build empathy around that experience. Um, I, to your point, I didn't speak English properly, fluently, until I was in the third grade, um, mainly because at home, Spanish was the language that was spoken, right? My parents were very mm -hmm. strict about Spanish. I think growing up, I was in, in a sort of act of rebellion, really mad at that rule. I wanted to speak English because I wanted to fit in, right? But my parents mm. wanted to make sure that I could still observe that culturally. But I think that the impact of that in my day-to-day -day in school was that I felt very alien. I felt like the outcast, the odd one out from that group. Mm -hmm. And it became very difficult to really relate to others. And more often than not, it led to misunderstandings, um, mm. which... I, I think in, in retrospect, oftentimes seems like a pattern where I'm trying to convey something, but because of the cultural the lang linguistic differences, um, it comes off a very different way and it's misconstrued. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
irrelevant I, manner, right? That presented a lot of issues for me as a student where teachers were often writing me up because mm -hmm. I, I was not sort of being like the rest, but it was really, I just didn't understand what was happening <laughs> in, mm -hmm. in that situation. How yeah, were you um, able to I adapt think the, to that? that? That sounds like a, a really difficult situation as a, really, as a kid to, to adapt to that. Um, and so... How, I mean, because obviously, you know, you 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 ended up being highly successful. You're a multi-time founder. You went to UT. You double majored. But yeah, how did you get that grit to overcome a lot of those obstacles? I mean, I had no other option, right? I think mm -hmm. it's it's that concept of you know we burned the ships. There's no going back. Like this is where we're at, mm -hmm. and we're only moving forward from here. So for me, like I, I wanted to adapt. I wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. It was just a challenge that it was very difficult, right? To mm -hmm. like balance everything that I was being exposed to. Plus add to that, the fact that I'm more of an introvert, very challenging mm -hmm. to interact with a lot of very energetic kids speaking in English, right. um, all, all trying to be a kid, right? Trying to fit in, trying to be accepted. Mm -hmm. Um, I think at the end of the day, my, my curiosity, my desire to learn and to grow was what pushed me forward. Um, and eventually mm -hmm. just that, that, that curiosity, right? How can I become the best possible version of myself, even as a kid, which sounds odd mm -hmm. to say, um, led to, to fostering better relationships. One thing that I did do was I, I often was very close to the teacher. Um, mm -hmm. some people might call it like the teacher's part, but I felt right, like that right. was a way for me to that relationship with the teacher so that they could understand where I was coming from and at the same time get their their support their understanding um mm -hmm. and it ended up accelerating that process for me I think very cool well how and kind of just describe yourself I'm just curious um how you were able to because University of Texas is I want to say it's probably one of the best schools and probably the best public school in the country um how were you able to like just describe yourself through those years in high school um, to pretty much, you know, get to UT Austin um, and then explain to us why you decided to study international relations and corporate communications. For sure. So, yeah, I think UT is one of the top universities um, at the public level, but also just globally. Um, mm -hmm. And I think to be totally honest, UT was not my goal. <laughs> I wanted to go to Harvard uh, or UPenn, right. Yale. Um, that's where sort of my my dream was. And I was very much working very hard towards that SAT prep and mm -hmm. all that. I just turned out to be a very terrible test taker. Um, and I think that was also one of the sort of limiting challenges that uh, didn't en enable me to move faster. But um, I had really strong grades regardless. I got into UT Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the challenge at the time was that uh, I was I was basically admitted into a new program called undergraduate mm -hmm. studies, uh, which had just been created um, for people who were undecided. <laughs> and I, I kind of saw that as a bit of a scarlet letter, where I was like, "Well, geez, every, these kids are like studying business or mm -hmm. chemistry or engineering, and I'm undecided officially, right? right. As like sort of my school." Um, I, I ended up seeing that that was one of the most, uh, valuable, um, placements in my life because mm -hmm. I met my best friends day one of college through that program. They've become investors in hang tight, my company to this wow. very day. Um, I've met, uh, some of my closest supporters in life and mentors, professors that I still, I see them as friends now from that mm -hmm. program. That program also opened my eyes to the world, right? I was so undecided and I got rejected by the business school, the Macomb School of Business at UT twice, right? First time trying to get mm -hmm. into the university and the second time uh, mm -hmm. trying to transfer. Uh, but I realized that perhaps that wasn't the path for me, right? All of my peers and, and my best friends from that program, everybody got into business school except me. Mm -hmm. um, what I felt what like a made failure. You Honestly, what I, made you decide to apply again? Because you applied at the beginning, you got into that program where it was for undecided majors, which was fantastic because you met your, some of your best friends. Um, but what made you reapply? Why did you want to get into business? Were you into entrepreneurship? 
um, when you're in high school? Did you have anything like interesting business projects? Uh, why did you reapply? I mean, I think it's a great question. I think I wanted to fit in. And at the same time, mm -hmm. I didn't really know what I wanted. I just thought mm -hmm. that business seemed cool. Uh, yeah. and, and I say business in the abstract. But it's like, as a freshman in college, you think of like travel and business suits and a stock right, right. or whatever, right? You know that it's really like consulting or finance and that's about it. Um, mm -hmm. But I just thought it would be cool. And more importantly, peer pressure, all my friends were getting in. Mm -hmm. um, and other friends I met outside of my school that were already in the business school. So I felt that's, that's what I want to do. I had done uh, some entrepreneurial projects as a kid back home with, with my parents. Um, we didn't come from money, right? So we, mm -hmm. we often struggled to make ends meet. Fortunately, my parents always put food on the table one way or another, like we always made it work. But uh, I remember when I was in high school, uh, I was in marching band and they did those mm -hmm. annual trips, uh, like vacation trips with a band to Disney World or right. to Washington. We just couldn't afford them, right? Even if they were like mm -hmm. 800 bucks for the whole thing, like that just was out of question for my family. Uh, but mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to go. I didn't want to miss out on the opportunity, so I would naturally find ways to make money and I would make cheesecake, right? I have a very good cheesecake mm -hmm. recipe. Um, I would make them at home. My mom would help me. Um, and then I would go I quite literally knocking door to door and sell cheesecakes for a nice markup. Uh, most profitable business I've ever had because it was 100% margin because <laughs> my mom would buy all right. the ingredients, right? Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to take that uh, that sort of enthusiasm for business and the the sense of like freedom and liberty when you build something for yourself, right? I wanted to mm -hmm. explore that more within school. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't happen though, as like you pointed out earlier, like it just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the the reality was that I had to adapt to something new. And at the time, mm -hmm. my my academic advisor, uh, Rose Mastrangelo, she said, well, hey, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. And by the way, I think there might be something you might be more interested in. I was like, well, what's that? And she's like, there's this new major that they're about to launch. It's called international mm -hmm. relations. It didn't even exist. Right? Like International what? relations weren't even a thing. The Austin. <laughs> and, and she's like, I think you'd be perfect for it because you it, want to travel. You want to and, you love how, how long ago was this? Because <laughs> it didn't seem that, that old, Armando. How long ago was this? Like, I'm surprised that... I was they launched that higher major? They um, launched it. It was like 2010 or 2011. I think it was one of those what? years. Um, which I mean, in Amazing. retrospect, it's, it's yeah. a year, right? It's a decade. Yeah. Um, but at the time, they were like, try it again. And in a sense, mm -hmm. it felt kind of like, ugh, I'm getting the bad end of the stick again. I got admitted mm -hmm. into a new school that didn't exist. I'm a guinea pig. Mm -hmm. I'm being offered to do a major brand new so i'm a guinea pig right whereas everyone else has access to sort of the established prestigious mainline programs but i'm just having to figure it out lo and behold i didn't you know you, you look back in time it's like wow it's like mm -hmm. i was a part of a startup at a right. new school a new major and they needed people like myself at that point in time to give feedback to help them understand how we can make this the best possible mm -hmm. major I got involved with government, uh, within the liberal arts, liberal so arts cool. school, et cetera. Um, but IR was eventually what opened my eyes to, um, to the world, right. To travel, mm -hmm. um, through IR, I, I got to study abroad in Paris at Sciences Po, mm -hmm. Paris. Um, I also decided that I love studying abroad so much that I wanted to mm -hmm. do a second degree that would allow me to do that. And that's why I also studied corporate communication. And that took me to Singapore, where I studied at NTU. Mm -hmm. um, so Why'd you, you know, it, it was Singapore. A bit... Just what what made you decide Singapore? Yeah, I think I'd always wanted to visit the other side of the planet. Um, mm -hmm. I know Asia as as a region altogether seemed intriguing, uh, and Singapore had always stood out just because of one, the language, right? English is one of the four official languages, but also it's, it's, it's a hub, right? For innovation, for tech, for finance, things that at that time in particular were of high relevance and interest to me. Right. So I said, why not? Right. And, and also I, I, I guess kind of wanted to be as far too, away right? as right? In Singapore. 
was one of the because I know yes they, you in, did you because I know you're fluent in French as well you, you're um I guess technically mm -hmm. you're trilingual um did you go to France just because you're already fluent in French or did you learn French and when you submitted to France? so good question I actually started learning French when I was in high school um so by the time that I was in uh, Sciences Po I'd done about two years of French in high school, two years of French in college, because it was required as a language. Mm -hmm. You have to learn a language, right? For international relations. Um, and then being in Paris, it couldn't enabled you me technically to just done solidify. Spanish? Like, just like, couldn't you have technically done Spanish? And I could. Just that, that box off? Is it, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely could have, but I think that really went at odds with, I guess, my values. Like, I, I wanted to learn. I wanted to, like, extend myself and do something totally different. But more importantly, I wanted to connect with the people there. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a thing that I made a very big effort when I was at, at Sciences Po. I didn't want to just spend time with other exchange students, whether from UT or from other programs. By and large, I wanted to meet the locals, like either the local mm -hmm. French students at Sciences Po and people in the city. And I think that that was what happened. And I've built mm -hmm. some great relationships and friendships that I still maintain to this day. Uh, but you asked, like, what made me want to go to Sciences Po? I think the language was one thing. Paris, obviously, mm -hmm. like, big, yeah. big draw. But Sciences Po is also, like, it's like the Harvard of political mm -hmm. science in Europe, right? Wow. Most of the presidents and senators of the region go there. So I thought it's a good place to, to learn, to grow, and to, to network. Wow. Amazing. And I'm, I'm assuming... Because how did that, did you go to university four years or five years? Because then you went abroad. Did you go two semesters in a row, like a whole entire year? Or how did that, how did you end up making that work? Because no. I know that you, you double majored. Um, so one was with your IR major, Paris was the IR, and then communications was in Singapore. But how did you end up making that all work yeah. in, in four years? I mean, it was five years, as you okay. aptly guessed. Okay. I, I did five years. <laughs> I think everybody was doing five years at that time because of the economy. You know, we were in the throes mm -hmm. of a pretty bad recession. People were saying there's no jobs. Just take mm -hmm. take out more debt and go to school, you know, and like, mm -hmm. so I think for me, it was like, that's fine to delay sort of living reality. Um, but it was absolutely worthwhile, right? I think mm -hmm. there's something to be said about immersing yourself in a new culture, throwing yourself into all of that. It changes you in ways that maybe mm -hmm. in the moment, you can see, but it changes you far, far out years later, your perspective, your decisions, the people with whom you mm -hmm. spend your time, it, it really does impact you. Um, on the subject of just being abroad and traveling, um, I follow you on Instagram, I noticed that you're always traveling. Um, if you could tell our listeners, what countries have you been to and then what's your favorite country and where do you recommend we go? Uh, the, the dreaded questions, right? These are always so difficult uh, because I, I love I love traveling. I love exploring new cultures. I love seeing the world. Um, I think I've probably been, last time I, I actually stopped to count, it was like around like 40-ish oh. countries that I visited. I've met people who've That's been to amazing. like over 100. So I feel like, oh, you know, I'm like, I, I, I have traveled a lot. There's so much more that I want to see. Um, I have not yet been to the African continent or Australia or Antarctica or South Asia. Um, but I have been all across Western Europe, all across Southeast Asia, mainland China a couple of times. Like, as in South Asia, South you, Asia, you mean like India or like Indonesia? In, uh, Pakistan, yeah. No, oh, Indonesia okay, I have. Sure. I've been there a couple of times okay. as well. Mm -hmm. But um definitely been to mainland china japan korea wow. etc uh, south america i've over the past few years i've visited a lot a lot of the different countries um i just feel like a very big draw to the region mm -hmm. uh, north america i've you know i've seen right. a lot of the u.s so much to see though it's vast mexico being mm -hmm. my homeland i've frequent uh, I, I frequent regularly what, i try to go back excuse me yeah. what part of mexico uh was your family originally from like what so, what region or what city yeah so i'd say the interior the republic all of us uh i'm from mexico mm -hmm. city like my oh, okay all my family's okay. really from mexico. 
Uh, but my dad's from Monterrey, sort of the northern, mm -hmm. which is like close mm -hmm. to Texas. My mother is from Michoacan, which is west Pacific coast. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, we, my life was as a kid in Mexico City and my parents were there at that time. Very cool. Um, and how often do you go back to Mexico? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I try to go like at least twice a year. I think mm -hmm. with the startup, it'll probably be a little bit more just because there's a lot of mm -hmm. opportunity in Mexico, Mexico City in particular for talent, engineering and product. Um, the reality is, I guess tying this to one of the earlier points is when, when my parents left Mexico, we left everything behind, right? Like mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. all of our combined families, and it's a very big family. Uh, mm -hmm. My mom was one of like 16. Everybody right. stayed behind. Uh, we were the only wow. ones to leave and come to America. So wow. um, I try to go back as often as possible. And I'm making more of an effort mm -hmm. to spend time with family because I didn't really grow up with them. Right. I'm sure they yeah. probably see you and, and really look at you as you know an amazing success in the States. Uh, but one thing I, I want to kind of dive into as well, I know recently I, I saw, because I was down in um, Latin America, I saw Mexico is actually the most powerful Spanish speaking country. And a lot of people don't know that. Was it like that at the mm -hmm. kind of when you were growing up there? How, how is like, do you know, like the economy of Mexico and how it shifted in the past 10 years? I'd love to hear your kind of your thoughts on that. Absolutely. And I think it's a very near and dear topic to me. Um, when I was working on my thesis uh, at UT, it was very much around Mexico becoming a superpower, economically anyway. Um, I think back then in the day, uh, when I was leaving Mexico as a kid, I think the tequila crisis, inflation was happening, as they so called it in the, in the Clinton years. I think Mexico, by and large, has the potential to become one of the most powerful economies in the world. In fact, mm -hmm. it was going to be included in the so-called BRIC countries. It was going to be called BRICM. Goldman Sachs at the time wanted to include it, but because mm -hmm. of the, the security factors, the drug war, the corruption, they thought it didn't make sense to include it as such. And I think they imagined that the company would go down. Um, I think we've seen a lot of improvements. Obviously, the country is still in turmoil from a social standpoint. Um, but I think if you look at a lot of the inflows for investment, uh, the country is doing very well, and it has mm -hmm. a wealth of potential, right? Mexico City alone has one of the highest, if not the highest, uh, per capita of millionaires in the world, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's something that a lot of people don't really see or understand because of the way that the media uh, positions Mexico right. as this sort of like <laughs> yellow tinted desert with cacti, right? It's just, <laughs> it, right, Mexico is right, a, right. a massive massive country um if you look at a map it's enormous and it has mm -hmm. uh jungles deserts tundras i think uh beaches geographically it's all kinds of things like it could be one of the most powerful places could just geographically it's it's pretty much in the center um of the world yeah, um, it is. in a sense and yeah. additionally it's kind of i mean the reason why the us is so you know positioned very well is because there's not many um, dangers, you know, near it, kind of like when you're yeah. in Asia, you're kind of connected to your Asia where there's a lot of different things going on, um, in the Middle East and Africa, but like here, it's like the U S is, I mean, there's Canada North and then, you know, and then Mexico itself is just becoming a superpower. And I know Mexico city, um, uh, is becoming one of the nicest cities in the world. Um, one of my good buddies that I met mm -hmm. in Buenos Aires is actually saying that Mexico city is, is his favorite city in London, but I'm not against it. I love Buenos Aires. It's don't get me wrong. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think Par uh, Buenos Aires is the Paris of the South. I think uh, Mexico City is the Paris of the West, so to speak, West of mm -hmm. France. Uh, and I think it's, I mean, it's a world-class city, right? It's on par with New York, mm -hmm. Tokyo, Los Angeles, et cetera. So I think there's, there's mm -hmm. a lot to do there. I think the biggest handicap, for the country right now, it's it's it's, it's limiting self belief, and I think a lot of that has to do with social issues, corruption, um, a lack of interest in in sort of progress, so to speak. And I think Mexico has the potential to to wake up from this sleep, right, and become the giant that it can be. 
I mean, I mean we, we see evidence of it, right? China, for example, is, in, is investing billions into Mexico. Um, I think others should take note of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Uh, I, I actually just think all of Latin America has huge potential. It just is unfortunate. Kind of Argentina is in the inflation um, as it's been in the past 100 years. But um, so you mentioned, yeah. you know, you're a global adventure. Uh, you know, you know, obviously three different languages. You've been all over the world, 40 different countries. Um, you did mention also that you went to the Peruvian Amazon jungle over 13 times. Um, and this kind of led you into entrepreneurship. Um, but could you kind of tell us what made you decide to actually, yeah, actually, can you tell us what made you decide to get into entrepreneurship? Let's just go. Sorry. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I think there's, there's different things. Uh, I think one of First and foremost, I think it was my parents, right? Uh, the sacrifices mm -hmm. that they made coming to America. I think if you're an immigrant, you're basically an entrepreneur, right? Because you have to start mm -hmm. from zero. You have to work 10 times harder than others to, to get to that equal level playing field. And it's just a, a journey of failure and challenge, right? Um, that was one of the biggest draws. Like I knew that there was something bigger that I had to work through. Um, and over mm -hmm. the years working in the corporate world, helping hedge funds, um, working on other startup ideas. Like I just knew that it wasn't enough and I had to do something mm -hmm. that was bigger than myself. Right. And mm -hmm. it wasn't just for me. It was, it was to honor my parents, the sacrifices that they've made and to be the, the leader that I've always wanted to see out there. Mm -hmm. Um, I think to the point you brought up, um, one of the reasons why I was going a lot to the Amazon jungle in Peru was, uh, to work with ayahuasca. I think it's a mm -hmm. plant medicine that's been used for thousands of years by the culture of the Amazon. And um, it's, it's, you know, very powerful plant medicine that gave me a lot of insight right into who I am, mm -hmm. um, what my potential is on this planet, what my purpose is with humanity. Um, and I, I very quickly learned that it was to help humanity heal, right? It was to help people mm -hmm. come together in different ways, right? We all, we all have different ways that we can help creative, physical, intellectual. Um, I know that I like to create art and write, and I think that's an area in which I can help. But I think mm -hmm. at this point in my life, it's very much oriented around entrepreneurship, right? Technology, uh, helping humanity um, work through a lot of its current challenges, right? Because look around you, the world's mm -hmm. not... <laughs> Not exactly doing fantastic, uh, right. all things considered. Um, and I think the um, being out there quite literally in the middle of nowhere, um, hours by boat from civilization surrounded by some of the most venomous snakes and <laughs> spiders and crawlers in the world, right? With, with the Shipibo mm -hmm. tribe really opened my eyes to realizing that mm -hmm. it's, it's time to get up stand up for myself and, and do what I've always wanted to do. And I think it's to it build something that would make my parents proud, but would also help me and give me a chance to change the world forever. How, how do you think ayahuasca um, maybe shaped your perspective um, into changing the world and helping um, kind of alleviate all, all these issues and all these problems that we have? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it came in many forms, right? I think one of the realizations was that nobody really knows what they're doing, right? We're all kind of like helpless kids, even the most mm -hmm. adults of adults. And we all just want to be loved. And we like all Elon just want to be accepted. Exactly, right? <laughs> Especially. <laughs> but I think, I think at the end of the day, um, it comes down to sort of like putting out the the world that we want to see and just being bold in creating that world and i think one of my biggest blockages was a deep-seated sense of insecurity um this idea that i wasn't good enough uh this idea that i didn't fit the mold um and mm -hmm. i in many ways you know i i myself could see evidence and evidence of it uh being an immigrant right uh kind of always being a late bloomer in many regards learning language getting into programs, getting the education I wanted, mm -hmm. um, being gay as a founder, being five foot seven in a society that's very tall, like feeling like I'm the short one, 
um, being bald, right? It always just felt like there's no way I could do that, right? And it's not for me. Mm -hmm. But I think the medicine really like forced me and confronted me with the reality that like none of that matters. And that at the Mm -hmm. end of the day, um, what matters is having the will to, to build those dreams and having very big dreams and actually doing it because, you know, the world is filled with dreamers, but not, not enough doers. And I think mm-hmm. um, the medicine really shattered that, that glass for me, so to speak, mm-hmm. by telling me, you need to get over yourself. <laughs> like very quite literally said, like, get over yourself. All of this, mm-hmm. I can't do it. It's not for me. I'm so insecure. No one's going to want to help. It's like, that's doesn't even matter because the startup that you need to launch, um, it's not about you. It's about impacting a lot of people that you you might never even meet, right? And and with the concepts mm-hmm. of hang tight, it's bringing people together in real life. And I think that's when it started to like click in my mind, where I realized it, I'm here concerned about my issues, but really there's mm-hmm. a bigger plan, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And my job is to build this platform and to get it out there, and to let I guess the universe, if you want to call it that, work the rest of the magic out. Very cool. There's a lot of things that. I'm going to digest it because there's a couple of things I want to dive into. First, I think you're probably one of the most amazing human beings that I've met just because of all the um, obstacles you've overcame. Um, you said that you were a late bloomer. I'm just impressed because you are trilingual um, English, Spanish, French. Like that's amazing in itself. You double majored at UT. You've been all over the world. Um, and it's interesting that your, your internal self is telling you that you weren't, when you're, going through ayahuasca and those experiences that you weren't, you know, that you have to drop it, let it go. But parts of you were saying that you you almost weren't like good enough, even though that you've exceeded a lot of um, accomplishments that many people haven't ever, you know, accomplished. I mean, most Americans only speak one language. Um, So speaking a a second language is, you know, you're, you're in the top, you know, 20% of America, at least. Um, But the other thing I want to get into um, so obviously, yeah, you already, you have a lot of great intermination. Um, but the other thing I want to get into is, um, hang tight. Um, how did you come up with that idea? Yeah. So hang tight is an idea I had back in university, my senior year of college. Um, it wasn't even called hang tight at the time. I think we wanted to call it like socially connected or something like that. Um, the, the premise was the same, right? I, I have friends, I know people, but being a normal human being that can be quite lazy at times, I don't want to have to figure it out. I don't want to know where people are, who's mm-hmm. available, what they want to do, when they want to do it, et cetera. And I said, there has to be an easier way to figure this out. Um, and we, we did start sort of working on it. I My roommate at the time, an engineer, um, we started working on the idea and giving a little bit of shape. That was also when I started to get involved in the Austin startup ecosystem uh, through Capital Factory. I was taking a class by Dr. Bob Bob Metcalf, who was the guy who invented the Ethernet, right? And he was teaching there at UT and also at Capital Factory. Josh Bayer was also my teacher at the time. Um, I was interning for one of the partners from Capital Factory, uh, Ivan Tokini, who had a a marketing agency here in the city. And I I said, I want to get into this world. but the biggest challenge was that I, I had to deal with reality. And for that meant mm-hmm. dealing with debt, right? Being a student, not coming from money, I had piles of student loans that, you know, I said, like, I'm not just going to expect some kind of handout. Like, I have to get this out of the way and I have to build my future and my dreams. So one of the pieces of advice that I received from people was like, get a real job, work in the corporate world, hate it, realize it's not for you, and then do a startup. Uh, and it turned out to be very good advice because uh, I, I paid off all my student debt in about a year. I was super frugal wow. um, and and learned a lot, right? I didn't work on the mm-hmm. startup idea for a while, actually for many years, almost 10 years. Uh, but it wasn't until um, about a year ago when I was at my past job that I was spitballing startup ideas with the person who's now my co-founder, uh, Rich Fortune. And, you know, we we talked about different ideas and this one came up, right? And he's like, hold on a second. That's really interesting. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's all right. It's just, you know, it's probably not going to work. It was a long time ago. Nobody probably cares. 
And he was like, no, 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 let's, let's explore it. Let's give it a little bit of shape. It sounds relevant. So we did just that. Uh, we talked to a lot of people, friends, family, mentors, people in the community. And surprisingly, people were saying that's very interesting as a concept, mm -hmm. right? Didn't exactly have a sense of the product, so to speak. But the concept of what we wanted to do changed the way that people come together, simplify the coordination process. It was really resonating. So we said, let's, mm -hmm. let's explore this. A um, couple of months later, I'm leaving my job at the time and jumping full time into this thing hang tight. And I promise you, friends, family, everybody was saying, you're absolutely crazy. Uh, <laughs> what are you doing? Like you, you mm -hmm. haven't secured any funding. Uh, you're leaving a place of relative security uh, to do something that's a social app in consumer tech and B2C, which is you know notoriously very difficult to fundraise, very difficult to build. Um, and, and it just felt right. You know, I, I realized that the problem had not been solved. Even to this day, as we innovate, there's still a massive gap that is waiting to be filled. Um, and I said, now is the time. Back then, when I was a college student initiating this idea, the timing was not right. You know, like people were barely catching on to smartphones. Uh, Instagram mm -hmm. was barely becoming a thing. So these kind of concepts were just not going to take off. Foursquare, for example, felt around that time. Mm -hmm. And Foursquare was kind of my, my light post. Um, so, you know, we, we jumped into this um, and we didn't look back. I effectively, I burned the ships, as they like to say, there was no plan B. And I think my parents were incredibly proud because they realized that I was taking big risks. And I mm -hmm. think most parents would at the end of the day be like, no, 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 I want the best thing for you. I want you to find a good job, get married, blah, 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 blah. But in their case, they were like, we're risk takers, right? They risked everything to come to America. And for them to see that uh, through me, I think made them very proud and excited. And um, it's made me feel very, very grateful to be on this journey. Wow. And for our listeners that don't exactly know what Hangtight is, they know it's a Hangout app. Yeah. What, what is, uh, what is Hangtight? Yeah. So... At its core, we're an AI-powered uh, social planning mobile app that simplifies the coordination process for, for real-life Hangouts. Um, basically, what we're doing is we're removing all the back and forth. We're removing all of the indecision, the ghosting, all the factors and considerations that lead to people not doing anything. Um, we're removing that and making it a very seamless process. Um, right now... It's, it's a little bit more manual as an app, as it tends to be when you're launching a new product. Uh, but we do have uh, some pretty good AI, uh, language, natural language processing uh, that's built into to the app, the experience. Um, I, I'll talk at a very high level about it, but our future is very mm -hmm. much generative. Um, that's mm -hmm. been sort of uh, in secret stealth work over the past few months. Um, AI is not going anywhere. AI is here to stay. Right. I know a lot of people say, oh, it's just hype. And there are hype cycles. But when we talk about AI, I mean, like fundamental technology and the place it has in our lives. Um, mm -hmm. We see Hangtight become your, your social assistant, right? Mm -hmm. your, your trusted confidant, your concierge. It knows you mm -hmm. to the T. It knows what you want, what you need. Perhaps one day it'll know you better than you know yourself, right? And it will give you more mm -hmm. of that so that you can have an enriching life wherever life takes you on this planet. Mm -hmm. It's just the um, kind of traction that you guys have had and just pretty much it's been under a year. Uh, I yeah. know that you guys recently acquired another startup. Could you talk about that process and how are you guys able to get that much traction in such a short amount of time? Yeah, it, <laughs> it's one of those things that you just, you don't even expect it to happen. I think one year ago uh, to this date, we didn't have what we have. I think we were just trying to raise on a pitch deck. Interestingly, we were meeting with some of the best funds in the world, like the, the name brand mm -hmm. ones we all dream of talking to. We, we had meetings with them and they liked the concept. They just wanted to see traction. Um, last November, right after Thanksgiving, I remember I was visiting home for the holidays and my co-founder rich he calls me on a sunday morning at 5 a.m which is not that odd because he calls me at like three in the morning at times for like a fire or something 
uh, but he insisted on me picking up. And I was like, what's going on? And he says, I have your Christmas present. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? He says, I think we there's an opportunity to, to acquire a competition. Um, they're, they're at a good spot for it. And I think their tech would be uh, super synergistic for what we're doing. Um, our competition at the time, Go Planet or Gather, as, as it used to be initially called, based here in Austin, um, they had about a two-year head start, right? They'd already wow. built the app. They, they were on, on iOS and on Android. They had about 8,000 users. Um, they'd already grown a following here within the UT Austin community and Austin, et cetera. And I said, if we could find a way to integrate them into what we're doing, that would be extremely beneficial. And I think because mm -hmm. of the timing, the circumstances, uh, the opportunity became very clear. Um, we we were able to receive some support from some close friends to help us finance uh, the transaction. Uh, it took about two months. I thought it would be sort of wow. like a two week thing, but you know these things always take longer than you think. Negotiations, mm -hmm. attorneys, all the the fine details. Um, but by the end of January, actually, right as I was returning from a trip that I made to the Amazon to do ayahuasca again. Um, we were finalizing the deal and transferring everything onto our servers. And I think that was our saving grace. I think if, if that situation and opportunity had not presented itself, we probably would not be talking right now, at least not about hang tight. Um, mm -hmm. I think we really struggled at the beginning to find um, the right technical talent. Um, and that was proving very challenging. We, we met a lot of interesting people, very talented people, but they just weren't a fit for, for our vision, for our culture, and for the task at hand. But with this opportunity, <clears throat> we received their full tech stack. Uh, we received machine learning models that have been trained, uh, users, right? And at the same time, we also that's, continue working with the engineers on contracts. That's, that's amazing because Go Planet. You mentioned they had about a two year head start. And I'm sure maybe some of our listeners are thinking, why wasn't it the other way around? Why didn't Go Planet acquire Hangtech? How were you guys able to kind of finesse that deal? <clears throat> I think it came down to um, sort of the circumstances. I think um, w the vision that we had made a lot of sense for them. And I think given mm -hmm. where they were in their journey, it made more sense to join this vision and to support what we were doing uh also given the reach i think one of the things that we see a lot in the startup community is oftentimes when you have brilliant engineers who can build anything they end up doing that right and they just build and build and build and build but then they get kind of surprised when it's not the next big thing or it hasn't gone viral uh, my co-founder and i we're not technical right we can do design mm -hmm. and like product management and all that but when it comes to engineering and coding that's not our, our wheelhouse or our strength nor do we want it to be. Um, so he said, look, we know how to sell. We know how to build relationships. We know a lot of people. We have this vision. We're not going anywhere. Like this is gonna happen like it or not. And I think it makes sense that we, we join and just move together. Um, and I think that really resonated with, with the engineers. Um, we live here in Austin. They're brilliant. They're machine learning AI engineers. Also went to UT. Uh, so it, it was a good fit for us at the time. Fantastic. Well, Armando, your story is super inspiring. It's amazing. Um, just lastly, is there anything else that you'd love to, like to share to our listeners? Um, they all know you're working on Hang Tight, but um, is there anything else that you'd like to, to share? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I love the premise of, of this conversation in the podcast. I think, um, Entrepreneurship can be a very lonely journey. I think we hear it, right? But then when you're actually doing it, you realize, oh, it's actually very lonely. And I think it's very, very important to know who you are, to know thyself. Um, I think if you don't have a clear understanding of who you are, <clears throat> and more importantly, why you're doing this, like your startup, your endeavor, your pro whatever it is, right? it's very easy to lose track and to lose hope, right? And to sort of deviate and give up, quit. Mm -hmm. And that's not what you want. I think people who like jump into startups, people who jump into these kind of risky adventures, um, they should know that they're doing something that most people will only dream of doing and get very few people will actually end up following through on. So I think 
if you're already an entrepreneur, go easy on yourself and give yourself a big hug, pat on the back, because you're doing something that most people don't even do, right? We all talk about wanting to do this and that and that, but you're actually doing it. And I think believing in yourself is key uh, because you're going to need that every single day. I think there's been moments on my journey here at Hang Tight where I could have given up or quit any day, <laughs> right? Where it's yeah. just like, I just don't know how we're going to make it to the next week. I don't know how we're going to find the money to, to do this or that. I don't know, like pulling in favors from every direction, begging on my knees for help for this and that. It's easy to want to say, you know what, I think I can find a job out of fund or I could just do something else and just not put myself through this. But at the end of the day, I recenter myself with my why, right? I recenter myself mm -hmm. with my parents, right? They give up everything for me to be here today. So giving up and quitting is unacceptable, at least in my eyes. Um, my journey, right? Unconventional late bloomer path. I'm already doing what most people aren't doing. So <laughs> it's okay if things don't make sense and they're not linear. Like I have to keep moving forward. But then also like just understanding like what do I want for my life, right? Like what kind of impact do I want to leave in the world? I want freedom. I want independence. I want to leave my mark and I want to leave the world a better place. And I know we need leaders who, who will do that. And that's why I can't give up, right? I have to keep my, my head up straight on high and, and moving forward and, and also listening to what, you know, ayahuasca told me, right? It's, it's not about me. <laughs> it's about mm -hmm. the bigger picture. There's people who need this, people that I don't even know, people who don't even know hang tight exists that one day we'll get in their hands and introduce them to their life partner, to a new friend, to a new employer. I have no idea, but I think don't give up is, is the main, main idea there. Um, the world needs more, more doers. We have a lot of dreamers. And if, if you have big dreams and you can do congrats, like you should be doing this right now. Um, and, and don't be surprised also, like if you in this journey as a founder kind of get terrified by seeing sides of people that you didn't realize existed. Um, I've seen a lot of that. I've seen, uh, unsavory sides of people that I thought loved and supported me. And suddenly they're I guess, hidden enemies and they don't support me and they don't love me. And that's good to know, right? Because suddenly you, you really know who these people are and why they're in your life. But then when you're at your most vulnerable, when you need help, right? When you just, you need help, you'll, you'd be surprised how many people will go out of their ways to help you unconditionally. And for me, that's been like a, a big revelation where it's like, wow, like <laughs> people really do believe in me. People really do believe in what we're doing as a cause, <clears throat> as a mission. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, treat it as an exercise, like these kind of experiences, launching a startup will show you a lot about who you are. It'll show you a lot about people who are in your life as well. So don't give up and, and hit it. And, and if you succeed, you succeed big. If you fail, guess what? Try again, do something else, but don't give up, give up, right? Just mm -hmm. keep on moving to the next thing. Dare, dare to be great. And, and Armando, I love, I love great. that. I don't think that could be. I don't think you could have said it any better. Um, I was literally getting goosebumps listening to that. Uh, I really appreciate your time today, Armando. I'd love to invite you as a guest on um, again some other time. Um, this is one of my favorite conversations. Um, so thank you so much uh, and take care. Thank you, Tyga. Cheers. Yeah.